Thanks, Aaron, uh, and thanks for joining everybody. Um, so uh, in the next half hour or so, and I'll take questions at the end, um, I want to share what we see in actually having LLMs in practice. I think, you know, you could go on Twitter and uh, everybody will say that LLMs are going to take your job or change everything. Um, and I think what we've seen um, from real data and how people use them um, in our product to query data is that they, they work well for some simple use cases. Um, but in a lot of situations, you want to be sure uh, about a result or you want to um, uh, know how something actually uh, happened. And so I'm going to talk about some of the, the, the challenges and workarounds to actually build production scale systems uh, that work, uh, that build user trust on top of LLMs. As a little bit about kind of what the company and product is, which I think will help contextualize um, the, the, the background and understanding for this. Um, we are a platform uh, for uh, mobile data analytics. So you can query data from your phone. Uh, we work on web as well, but really the realization was that um, it needed to be a step change easier to be able to ask questions of data without relying on having to write SQL or go to someone on your data team. So me and my co-founder, uh, we met about 10 years ago at MIT. Um, it rarely was this beautiful and sunny there, um, but we realized that this problem kind of existed and uh, that you needed to make uh, using data step change easier. So we built out uh, visual interfaces for querying, of course, SQL. And then the most interesting one was when the bomb dropped of OpenAI, uh, really rethinking around uh, how that could change uh, interaction patterns. So you could ask questions with natural language. What we quickly figured out, and I think anybody who's building on top of LLMs have uh, figured out is you can't really just throw a text box into your product and and have it work well. And so I'm going to talk through some of the nuances of, of getting it right. To, to set the stage a little bit, the idea of asking a question in natural language and getting results uh, from that is not new. So what you see um, is, is what uh, uh, Microsoft Power BI has had for quite a while. Tableau had flavors of this. Clear graph, uh, thought spot, um, and the idea was you could ask a natural language question and get a graph or get a get a, uh, a table uh, as a result. What you'll see though um, is that it was really really limited. So this is um, from Microsoft Power BI's documentation. They said multiple conditions aren't supported, so you couldn't do something like say, uh, show me which of my customers are in Texas and uh, purchased at least a hundred dollars. Uh, of product from me last year, because that would be multiple conditions. So you couldn't do that. So these were really, really, really limited. And you'll notice, um, you'll see these red underlines um, on, on the screenshots. That was where something is misspelled or unclear. And before LLMs, you basically needed to map each of those meanings uh, to a field or to a specific value. Because if you didn't, uh, your, your, your natural language questions wouldn't be understood. So the idea of going from natural language to a graph is, is, is pretty old. The ability to do that well, uh, uh, though, is, 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 is new. And so before uh, OpenAI and this, this new wave of, of GPT uh, style models, um, the, the sort of state of the art was uh, some of the models I, I'm showing you on the right. So there was a thing called Rat SQL. Uh, from Microsoft Research. ServiceNow had something called Picard, which was uh, reasonably good at getting English to SQL, but needed a, a really specific wording. It couldn't necessarily understand the difference or similarity in a concept like revenue versus uh, sales, as if you don't have sales as a field, but you do have revenue as a field, maybe you want to disambiguate too. To, to that. So it didn't have a great conceptual understanding of how different words were related. It could say, hey, I see this field name. I can match the field name and write a query around that. Google also then had uh, uh, bidirectional encoder representations from transformers, the BERT model. Um, and all these worked OK, but not great. And were pretty finicky. So the big uh, development with with OpenAI and now Google's Palm V2, and there's others like Vacuna, uh, there's Falcon, which is a $40 billion model out of the UAE. 
Um, the big breakthrough here was that you then start bringing an understanding of different domains, right? So you go from saying, um, I don't know what sales is. I don't know what revenue is. I don't know how to disambiguate when you say, what is the sum of sales? Um, if I only have a field called revenue to, hey, now I have this much better understanding uh, that's encoded of, of kind of human language and how concepts are related so I can disambiguate those things in, in a way that makes sense. So that was the big shift that happened uh, as, as some of these LMs started coming out. It also made it much easier to use. So you could feed in just table names or views and field names um, and get out SQL as a result. Uh, uh, not always right, but at least that was the, the general idea. And then a lot of the practical considerations of trying to get some of the previous models I talked about uh, up and running of needing to have a ton of memory and uh, set up the infrastructure and train them or retrain them on your tables or views or schema uh, was radically simplified when you can just call an API um, to, to OpenAI. Uh, research code uh, does not a production service make um, and uh, uh, OpenAI made that a step change easier. And it also made it a step change uh, more affordable because you didn't need to go uh, provision all these GPUs for model training and stuff like that. So normally you might say, hey, it's super easy for me to jam an LLM into my, my, my app and create a great experience or a thing that's really cool. I think it's true that you can kind of jam OpenAI or a search box or a text box into your app and get something that, that you could probably demo well. Um, it's as easy as, sort of the, the query I'm showing you right here nominally, but it's actually much harder to get good results in practice. So um, if I wanted to uh, get a SQL query for all customers in Texas uh, with the name of Jane, um, I would pass it my schema, in this case, uh, these columns up here uh, and the name of the table, in this case, customers, and tell it that I want the query for that. And GPT-4, Palm V2, uh, Vacuna, there's a number of other models floating out there, um, can basically do that. Um, and for a simple question like this, uh, get that right. But with even a slight complexity, they'll start getting it wrong. So for instance, let's say um, your uh, customers in Texas for, for state, Texas is actually represented as TX. Well, this will say where state equals, quote, Texas, close quote. And if your data is structured such that Texas is TX or low case Texas, uh, it won't it won't actually give you what you want. And so that's where there's a lot of engineering or prompt engineering that goes into getting much better results that kind of behave like you expect them to. So I want to talk through kind of some of the practical considerations, the unexpected goodness as we've taken and I'll show you kind of what it looks like in the product. So a user here. Uh, can say uh, how many, uh, which products are out of stock, and they'll be able to type that in natural language and zing, and out the other side, they get this list of products. And they can see the SQL that was generated. Um, if, if the question kind of should generate a graph, we generate a graph. So you have logic for how all that stuff should work. And so the unexpected goodness, the things we just kind of got from the model out of the box uh, that worked really well, were the ability to uh, kind of disambiguate disambiguate you know, sales, sale, revenue, revenues, misspellings, and still get results that kind of match to the field names if they existed um, that match to users intent. The models are also pretty good at handling things like um, uh, WTI, which I think stands for West Texas Intermediate in the uh, oil and gas space. Uh, so you could say WTI price, could map to the field name WTI crude oil price. Um, and it can handle those differences reasonably well. It also could do cross table joins or cross view joins uh, if they're reasonably simple and use uh, the same or similar uh, uh, field names to match on. Um, and it worked better uh, out of the box without any uh, fine tuning, any of that stuff than uh, Tableau, ThoughtSpot, any of these others did um, unless you've invested a lot of time in structuring your data and giving building out a semantic layer and all this other stuff. You basically could you know, have a table, have fields, 
point an LLM and a question at them uh, and be able to get you know a, a, a SQL query. The unexpected badness, though, and I think this is really where it comes in if you're a, if you're a builder or founder or a data analyst as something to think about is uh, you may have a query that doesn't necessarily get you a graph. It doesn't necessarily uh, give you the level of aggregation that you need to have a um, more understandable result. So if I say, show me, let's take a, a trivial example, um, show me sales over time. Well, if my sales are actually in a timestamp and that timestamp is actually down to a millisecond level of, of granularity, that's a pretty unhelpful graph to show. And so there's this additional kind of logic layer that you need to build out or instruct your LLMs uh, to take into account when they're building, building your SQL to then say, actually, I want to see this by day or actually, I want to see this by week. Uh, another thing to be aware of. Uh, they're very finicky with wording. So if you say, show me sales by region um, versus show me total sales by region. Well, sales could be a count of sales. Uh, total sales is probably a sum. And so in order to kind of give it the right hints where there is ambiguity, right? Is sales by region a sum or a count? Uh, you sometimes need to put in these, show me the count of sales by region or sum of sales by region. Um, where uh, it, it, it might otherwise get that wrong. You also need to do things uh, like give it guidance about what's in fields. We were talking about the Texas example before, um, so that it, it, it isn't guessing in the wrong ways that will result in queries not working. And then uh, you also can't do things very well like reverse lookups. So knowing that um, you know if a user says, show me uh, uh, customers in Japan, you might have two fields. You might have region one and region two in your table, and you might not really uh, uh, have given the model enough context to figure out is Japan a value in region one or a value in region two. So you can create these like lookups um, uh, to, to then kind of refine what the model knows and, and have it give better results. Uh, there's other things you could do like pre-processing to say, hey, I'm only going to tell the model that region one exists if I know Japan is a value in region one. And I won't even tell the model when I'm prompting it over here with, with different columns. I'm not going to give it the columns that are irrelevant for it or that wouldn't contain uh, uh, the values that, that uh, I'm looking to match against. And then lastly, um, there's a lot of uh, uh, data sets which are large. And if you get above something on the order of 100, 150 tables, um, depending on how many columns are in each table, You'll just get too much, uh, uh, too many tokens for the models to be able to handle. That's changing a little bit, and there's larger variants uh, that can handle larger kind of token sizes. So this will probably become less of a problem over time. So I want to show you kind of what we built out and then how we're refining that to make it better. So uh, you can ask in plain English or French or Spanish or Japanese or, or German or Arabic, uh, a question in natural language. Um, we have a search bar at the top in, in the Zing app. And then uh, that will connect to OpenAI or Palm V2 um, and generate the SQL. And then that SQL runs live against your cloud data warehouse. And that could be anything from Microsoft SQL, uh, Google Sheet, uh, Excel file, uh, Snowflake, whatever it is, wherever your data lives. Um, and then uh, one thing we figured out was Sometimes there's a question that you've already asked or a colleague has already asked, in which case you don't necessarily want to go ask that from scratch to OpenAI or Palm V2. Instead, you can want to use the social context that you've got uh, from the fact that other colleagues or you have already asked that question and maybe saved it. And so that's actually probably a more reliable uh, source than, than kind of going to the models from scratch. So we had this UI where you ask a question, we show you a graph or a table, and then we realized kind of quickly that um, it only worked well on the order of 20, 30% of the time. And what I mean by works well is that a user doesn't need to go reformulate that question, uh, like word it differently, nor do they need to uh, change the SQL, nor do they need to go to like a visual querying interface. They're able to just like, save that question, which means that they think the result kind of looks looks good uh, without needing to do reformulation. 
What that means though, is 70 to 80% of the time, the results that um, these LMs are spitting out for data queries are just not, not quite what someone's looking for or not very good. And so that's where we've thought about, um, I think to Matt's earlier point on how you build affordances uh, uh, to make LMs more useful. Uh, what we've done here, and this is shipping uh, later this week, is instead of showing you just a result or instead of showing you the SQL that was generated, um, if you wanted to understand how we got the result, instead we're actually visually saying, hey, here's this thing that we're putting on the Y axis. Here's this group by, we talked about timestamps before. Here's this logic we're applying where a timestamp is grouped by day. And if you want, you can you know, tap um, any of these things and, and say, oh, actually I want the count instead of the sum or the median instead of the sum, or I want to group by month instead of day. And you can kind of refine uh, what is shown uh, uh, to, uh, to a user uh, without them needing to uh, go, go, go type in SQL and kind of debug it. Because one of the big challenges is there's this weird uh, gap between, hey, I have a question with natural language. Anybody can ask any question. They don't need to know anything about SQL. They don't even need to know too much about the underlying data source. And they'll just get a graph. They'll get an answer. And it's going to be great. Which, in theory, is, is awesome. But then the challenge is if it doesn't give you quite what you need and you're in this world of debugging SQL, then a lot of folks uh, who are less technical don't necessarily know how to work through that and how to get to something useful. And so that's why we've thought about, and, and, and again, this goes back to Matt's point on creating the right affordances and the right UI and not assuming that the LM is always going to get it right. Where we said, okay, a user, even if they're non-technical, will see exactly what is happening. And if they can uh, see that that's not what they want, they can modify it uh, very, very directly. So when I asked Stable Diffusion uh, to write me a, a, a movie poster for all the data everywhere all at once, and you kind of see uh, it doesn't quite get it right. It has you know, parts of the idea. I think that's kind of the state of the union for uh, data analysis uh, powered by uh, powered by these large LLMs. I think it's going to get better, uh, but I think that's just kind of where things are uh, at, at present. So what did we do? Well, we, we looked at ways we could kind of make this more deterministic. So um, let me show you here. If I can get it to animate. Here we go. Um, so uh, you can see a deterministic way where we said you can choose a data source. You, you know, choose what table you want to deal with. And deterministically, so this is like some hacker news posts, deterministically say, I want to get the count of posts and I want to see that by type. Great. That's a very deterministic, very clear way where I can drag these fields to get exactly what I want. Uh, that's a very clear, very deterministic way to get a result without necessarily uh, needing the LLM to always get it right. Because if we show you here, with an easy kind of GUI to make it right, if the LM doesn't get it right, then you have a lot more control over what's going on. And you don't have to play this, this kind of frustrating, sometimes confusing game of let me reword it, let me reword it, let me reword it, and hope that the LM uh, gets it right with each iteration, which can actually take longer than just deterministically doing the thing you want. Now, one of the cool things that we do is once you've created this question deterministically and saved it, we can then use that to fine tune the LLMs. So um, uh, I think uh, uh, Brian asked a question um, about, uh, or Marshall asked a question um, on relying out of the box LLMs versus developing your own models. Um, and I think what we've seen makes the most sense right now is not building individual models for each user at this point. Um, the way you kind of construct a SQL query is going to be, be similar across use cases. Um, what you do, do need to do is, is provide schema information about um, the fields and stuff like that to make it better. And then the other thing that we're pretty excited about and in the early innings on, uh, but I think is going to be a way to make this a lot better, is to use these questions where someone saves this deterministically as training data. So let's say you create five questions deterministically, not using LLM, and your colleagues create five questions. 
Well, if you can feed that back in um, as uh, fine tuning examples to Palm V2, which you can do via Vertex, um, which is like Google Cloud's way to kind of fine tune models and stuff, um, or give additional training examples for OpenAI, then you start getting models that um, are smarter about the way that you ask questions or your organization asks questions. And so the, the, I think this is going to be a really interesting uh, development where it goes from I am asking a foundational model a question to instead I'm refining the foundational model to my own use case. Oh, by the way, and that also has some social context, right? Because if a question is right or wrong, um, there's people in your organization who probably know that. Um, and even if you're not technical, maybe someone else at your organization has already asked that same question and was more technical. They can save that. That can then become a, a, a kind of ground truth, if you will, uh, answer for that question. So when you're working with these LMs and getting back responses, it's pretty important to note that a response is not necessarily a correct response. And if you want to build a product that is reliable, that people understand, um, then you need to do a good amount of engineering and refinement uh, around uh, uh, around making that uh, 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 an experience where people know what's happening and can fix it if it's not right. So common thing we see, um, and we've done work to fix, but we would pass, as I was saying before, kind of schema and, and field names. And we would get results, we would get queries back from, from OpenAI uh, that would contain tables and fields that were not uh, provided to it. And so what that means is those queries will not run. Uh, and that's pretty frustrating to a user. They just get an error. They don't know why. Um, and they don't know why the model is, is generating uh, unrunnable SQL. Um, so one thing we did to refine that was say, um, return false. So we added an additional uh, guidance in the prompt to say, return false when the required tables or fields to answer this question are not available. And that then let us say, great, we know that it's not gonna answer this question well, we can show a user fields that they can pull from. We can show a user tables that they can query and lead them towards like a visual querying flow. Or we can ask the model in a slightly different way do a second shot prompt. Um, we can also engineer checks for if the uh, tables and fields uh, needed to run the query are there. And if not, you know, send a user down, down a path to maybe refine the way they worded their question or make sure that they're using field names or something close to field names that already exist. So these are ways you can start building a, a, a product and infrastructure and UI uh, around this, this kind of somewhat variable uh, response that you're getting from the LMS. Another thing we've seen is that, you know, we'd have users ask a question and we'd show a graph, um, but that didn't give enough confidence to end users uh, uh, that the query was correct. And so we had a way where, you know, they could tap and see the SQL. Um, but the challenge was for, for folks who, who were technical, they, they, they didn't see what was actually happening visually. And so it's hard to know if that was correct or incorrect. And so what we found was a much better way to do that is show this kind of visual interactive query builder that says, here's what we understand your question to be. Does that look right? And then when they say yes and run the question, uh, they have a much higher level of confidence that the question actually being asked, the query that's being run is, is, is what they want. And then uh, one other note uh, is, is, is that you don't always need to rely on LLMs. So I think there's an inclination to say, hey, you know, we'll just uh, 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 directly hit the LLMs whenever a user has a question. But in fact, anytime a user saves something, uh, anytime that they've created their own query and saved it, um, that's actually uh, something that you probably want to surface. If you think about, I used to work at Facebook and LinkedIn, and if you think about a social network, you think about Stack Overflow, um, you go and you look at answers or, or meal uh, restaurant recommendations from people you know, from uh, your colleagues, from your friends. And so uh, you don't need to restart from scratch by asking this question. Uh, you instead can resurface uh, some results that have already been asked uh, by other people. Um, and you can use that 
also as a way to fine tune these models. If you have a huge amount of that, you can rebuild models uh, from scratch on it, um, but that requires a lot more, more data. So typically uh, you'll wanna do something more in the fine tuning realm. A little bit about kind of our architecture and how we do it. So um, we connect to uh, your database, any major database, I think there's a list of them here, Trino, Databricks, BigQuery, Sheets, Redshift, ClickHouse, uh, Postgres, and so on. And then if you have a natural language question, uh, we take that, run it through a couple models, do a little bit of pre-processing, a little bit of post-processing. And the post-processing allows us to go from this, this table or this query uh, to a graph. So we have an idea of, okay, uh, if it's a time series, time should be on the x-axis. Uh, or if there's a couple group buys, then we probably should display it uh, as a stacked bar chart uh, so that we can uh, make out the, the, the different series. Um, and so there's, there's engineering and logic beyond kind of the, the, the base call to an LLM. There's also looking at multiple LLMs to figure out, uh, are they in agreement with each other? Uh, are they giving us similar types of results? Um, and as a function of that, are we more confident in the alignment between multiple models as giving us a, a, a better result? So let's say I had three models that I'm running the same question through. If those don't match, that means that maybe there's a pretty big difference in how they're interpreting the speech. And there's probably a, a good degree of, of, of risk that um, I'm generating a query that's not right. Uh, or that certainly could be con could, could, uh, uh, interpreted in other ways. Uh, so running multiple models is like a waterfall or in parallel is also a way to kind of uh, get a sense on if the output you're generating is high confidence or not. Uh, so a little bit about kind of how this works. Uh, we have a, a, a user, 7-Eleven, uh, not in the US, but in one of the other countries they operate in. And they basically hooked us up to ClickHouse and then they can ask questions like, um, which products are out of stock for this store? Or um, show me uh, my fastest selling um, beverages. And it takes something that used to require a data team and building dashboards and makes it something they can kind of do uh, with natural language really easily. And then because we're mobile, once you've created these kind of cool uh, questions or queries, you then can do things on top of that, like set up real-time alerts. So here I'm saying, let me know, send me a push notification when uh, uh, number of events uh, goes above uh, some level or show me which stores uh, have sold at least a hundred dollars of uh, products uh, in the last day. And we you know, can show that all on a map and we can know your current location if you turn on um, uh, that ability uh, so that you're then able to ask these natural language questions that are specific to your current location or specific to kind of your own, your own data. So takeaways, and then I'll, then I'll uh, uh, cover any questions folks have. Create deterministic fallbacks. Don't assume that everything someone needs to do, they're gonna be able to do via kind of uh, re-prompting and re-prompting uh, over and over again. Create a way they can get exactly uh, what they need um, without having to rely on the LLM being, being perfect. Build affordances for incorrect responses. Use human knowledge and social information, saved queries, what colleagues have done, um, so that you're not kind of reinventing the wheel each time someone asks a question. Typically, if you've asked a question, a lot of your colleagues will have a similar question, and you can kind of benefit from uh, uh, what people have done uh, before uh, to, to, to kind of skip people to the right answer. Uh, try running models in parallel. That's a way you can kind of get a better read on um, if, if uh, the results are consistent across models and hence how confident you might be in them. And then uh, uh, engineer smart guidance for uh, uh, kind of how a user navigates the system. So if they get a result that's not good, say, hey, here's a visual way you can do this, or here's um, a, a list of tables or fields or whatever it is so that a, a user can do that on their own. Um, with that, uh, would be happy to take any questions. If you want to try Zing, you can try it out for free. Um, it's on the App Store and Play Store. It also works on the web, uh, zingdata.com. 
And if any of you are looking for jobs, we're hiring a product designer, a business lead, and a backend engineer. With that, I'll open it up for any uh, questions that folks have. Super awesome. Thank you so much, Zach, for sharing. I like found myself taking screenshots and like remembering to go watch back this, watch this again later. But we have a couple questions from the audience. First one from uh, Marshall. Zach, even now you seem to you rely on out of the box LLMs as opposed to developing your own models with such development in the field and quite sophisticated refinement. So yeah, yeah. So so right now, um, building a model from scratch, and you can do it, and it's getting much better and much cheaper. Mosaic ML, which recently sold to Databricks for uh, eye-watering amount of money, uh, uh, basically tries to make it much easier. Um, and so you can train these things on your own from scratch. For something where you want a good understanding of how concepts are related, and you actually need to kind of ingest a large corpus of how people use language, right? Like that sales is related to revenue and stuff. If you have a huge corpus on your own, you could kind of kind of figure that out, but you're probably better off uh, starting from one of these models that understands the world pretty well and then fine tuning it for uh, your use cases. Uh, uh, and fine tuning has gotten a lot better. So uh, one of the cool things of the last, I guess it's gotten popular over the last couple months, uh, but the idea that you can sort of uh, make these slight tweaks without needing to rebuild a model um, in a much more affordable way. And I won't go too technical here right now, but if you just look at like fine tuning, um, that's that's kind of where to get started from. And it allows you to change kind of the way the model behaves uh, without needing to invest all the uh, uh, GPU uh, time and money in, in rebuilding it uh, from scratch. Totally agree. And I think the fine tuning stuff, and I can I actually have a collection of resources on that is super helpful. It's hard to teach machines how to do computers and speak English. And, and the more like layers of complexity you add, it always gives kind of the, the build or buy scenario becomes a very new question. But I love this question here from Matt on how many times on average do folks retry prompting when the first prompt doesn't work? Yeah, uh, so what we see is uh, folks will retry probably three to five times. And if they don't get to an answer they want, uh, then they fall back to these other affordances. So in, in the um, example we have, in our case, that's this like drag and drop, like visual query builder thing. And uh, so, so they typically will go to those after three to five attempts of like rephrasing. Um, I'd say that someone, if it's a simple question, they probably get their answer. If I say like, how many customers do I have? And I have customer ID one, customer ID two, right? Kind of customers, that's right 95% of the time probably. But once I start asking these like, what are two more notches more involved questions? I'd say that people actually, even once they've reformulated, only get to a success state uh, with the LMs. And this is on their own data, on real world data, um, probably 30% of the time, even with all that reprompting. So uh, uh, it's not amazing right now. It will get much better fast, um, especially as you do these like fine tuning on your own, uh, on, on your own examples. But a product that works well 30% of the time is not going to be a thing that you rely on to like run your business. It can be a thing that like helps you. Uh, but we still see that the vast majority of the time users go to, to these kind of more deterministic ways of getting an answer. Right on. And I think like, yes, the, the 30% is never a good metric when we're looking at success metrics. It's like, I always talk to people of like, when we think about building a model or using a model, why, why are we doing it? Like the best, uh, it's from one of the, the no search press books, but it's like machine learning is just a way of solving a problem or answering a question. Is at the end yeah. And hopefully it's an aid to do that. And over time it will be a much better way to do that. But I, I, I think, uh, if you're saying, Hey, what products do I need to restock? Right. I'm going to buy more of those things and spend money. Uh, if that's not working, uh, then you want uh, uh, a more deterministic way to get to that. And I think that's where like 
if you're on Twitter and you see someone saying it's going to like fix everything or change everything, I think it's going to help a lot of stuff over time. Uh, but the state of the art, at least for, for querying complex data sets, is uh, it's, it's, it's not quite there to rely on. Uh, just yet. What, are you saying that like we all might still have jobs at the end of this AI <laughs> rush? Wild concept here. Um, we'll have to check in a decade, uh, a decade <laughs> from now and see. Uh, see uh, I'm looking forward to that. We can all go to the beach together. Um, but thank you so much, Zach.